Boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to day three of the Ad 15 miles per hour to your Serve in Five Day Surf Challenge. Throw some comments down below. Let us know your favorite parts from days one and days two. If you are so lucky as to just be catching this randomly on the internet, we are in the middle of a five day surf challenge, and you will see here a link to where you can go and get the recording. So if you miss day one and day two, that's where you're going to want to go and grab that stuff. But we're going to give it a minute or two here to let people flow on in and tell us their favorite parts from day one and day two. And then we will get this party started with day three. You want to give them a little teaser as to what day three is all about? Yeah. So if you missed, day one and two day one was all really fundamentals we talked about how like if you don't have the correct fundamentals just the starting phase of the serve the rest of it is really difficult uh to, to execute and then yesterday was kind of the aha moment right like we talked about the racket drop how to focus from the elbow and not actually the racket we talked about how to create racket head speed uh and a number of other things now what we always find especially when we're working with students we explain these things and Students can conceptualize it, but they have a hard time putting it together. And that's what today is, is about creating this rhythm to the serve because all great serves have rituals and they have really good rhythm. So it becomes repeatable. Yeah, we talked a lot on day one really about just the foundations of what to do with your feet, what to do, syncing some things up. And then yesterday and day two, we started to get into a little bit more of like the early racket mechanics. We haven't really talked about how to swing at the ball at all yet. So that is what today is all about. And like Nate just mentioned, building a rhythm and making sure this is something that's smooth. So so if you missed day one and two, check out this link on the screen. That's right, because that's where you can grab the recordings. That's right. Our, our man, Roberto from Costa Rica, chiming hey, up, in. Man? Roberto, we what's going on? We were just talking about Costa Rica. We were I just talking. be there uh, in December. You should hook up with Roberto. You guys should, should hang out. Yeah, let me know if you want to hit some balls. Or surf, he's better at that. I mean, we, we assume that we're, we're going to the same place in, um, in, in Costa Rica. But heading down to Tamarindo, Playa Grande, get a little surfing in, let the wife sit on the beach. Is that, is that big beach, Playa Grande? My Spanish isn't that wow. good, but, <laughs> but I have a feeling. All right, well, with that foolish comment, let's go ahead and get started with day three here. Kick it off, my dude. What, what do you got for us? All right, so day three, let's just... You know what? Should we give them a little review with the workbook? I feel like that's always yeah, kind of helpful. But we're going to go over this quickly. So don't don't throw in a ton of questions quite yet because we don't want to get bogged down. I'm going to. Give I, I you bet a lot of people are thinking, man, I just wish there was a way that I could have access to this workbook. Well, great news, you can. Yeah. If you go to this link right here, it's included with the recordings. All right, I'm I'm done. I can't help nice it. Too. I can't help it. Let me hide this thing so you can see our screen. Let's party up. Day one. Exercise one was all about your continental grip, making sure that the index knuckle is on bevel two. But the key here is also your heel pad. All right. So we're going to move through that. There was an exercise that went along with it. Um, and then we talked about the surf stance. The big piece of the surf stance is having the ability to load your back leg. Any sport that it requires throwing has this same loaded position of, of the hip. Just the difference in tennis is that you're throwing the ball up. You're not throwing it. And you're not, it's not a, you know, it's not linear. You're That's not the big one. Throw on the Hail Mary, not a, not a baseball pitch. That's right. Uh, so day three, penalty box drill. Don't get confused. This isn't about the location of your toss. It's about what your tossing arm is doing and making sure your arm is going all the way up. Because when your arm goes all the way up, you enter the shoulder, hip, rear, pelvic tilt. And the greater degree of that tilt, the more access to power. So simply... Interrupting you really quick, they say your microphone is not working correctly. I don't necessarily believe them until I see more than one person say it, but are you muted? How's this, how's this audio, Kenny? Oh, this is the problem with uh, with going live. You're live. You're so, muted. No, no, you are muted. I just powered out. You were muted. Was not muted. You were not muted. Yeah, All right, we reboot it. How, how about now? Can we, get, can we get the black screen of like technical difficulty? Yeah. <laughs> A little power, it's, you know, that, well, that works for anything. You power down and then you power back up. It's like your phone. So oh, like your it's... mic is money. I see it right here. All right. There we go. Derek says I heard it. Okay, great. Sorry about cool. that, guys. I don't even know if anything was actually broken, but carry Might on. Been. Might have been. So penalty box drill. Just remember, this exercise is all about tossing the ball and allowing it to come down with your arm all the way up. Scott and I see this every time we do these clinics. Everyone tosses, and as the ball comes down, they drop their arm. Guess what's going to happen? There's going to be zero rear pelvic tilt, and then your head's going to pull down. And if you're hitting your serve in the net, nine out of ten times, you're probably pulling your head down. Indeed. 
All right, uh, this was about the toss. Just a simple exercise of getting the racket face out into the court. We said six to eight inches. Uh, we won't spend too much time here, but making sure that arm follows the toss all the way up. Pay super, 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 super close attention right here because this is the meat and potatoes. If you get this wrong, you will never serve over 100 miles an hour. Yep, the right to left drill. The right to left drill just initiates this way. Palm down, loose wrist, and pulling the racket to the head. And then getting into a position to where as the arm is going up, the arm works back. You can see my hitting arm. Oh, hitting arm. Hitting arm. Hitting, hitting arm is on the non-dominant side of my body. That is the beginning of the right to left. And in this drill, we don't want them to choke up like this. You're just doing this to make it easier to see in the workbook, right? You want your hand all the way at the bottom of the grip. Want the hand all the way at the bottom of the grip. We actually we we had people start here just to because you have so much feel, yep. and then dropping the hand to get down here to incorporate it. That's good that we covered that because we haven't talked about that in a while. All right, um, elbow the ball drill. So here, a lot of people think about putting the racket in a certain place, right? Don't don't worry about Scratch putting the your racket. back, patch your ponytail. All that instruction is incorrect. Yeah, no, no, no good here. So what we want you to focus on is just allowing the elbow to lead up on the ball. Scott talked about yesterday about, about how to get the elbow there. One of the things I like to think about as well is in the morning when you wake up and you do one of these big stretches, you're like, ah, right? If I'm here and I tilt back, the way my elbow goes up to the ball is the same way. I want to be on the same plane so like that the cartwheel. elbow comes this way. Okay, so yeah, like a cartwheel. Exactly. All right. Um, and then the pulse-up drill. You want to tell me about the pulse-up drill? Yeah, so guys, the idea here and the example that we gave that I think usually helps people the most, imagine you've got – imagine your racket just weighs – 500 pounds or that's probably unrealistic imagine your racket weighs a little bit more than you're capable of pulling up with your tricep and you've got to activate your legs to sort of help yourself get that racket moving that's what we're talking about with the pull sub drill activating that back foot to trigger the hip to trigger the elbow and that sounds complicated but again if you just think about you know you've got a really heavy weight in your hand and you can't get it off the ground with just your arm but then when you bend your knees and sort of pop a little bit that weight starts to float up that's the same feel that we want, and that's how you're going to sink your leg strength and power into your stroke. And now, without further ado, day it three. is time for day three. Game on. So this has been around forever. There's devices that are sold, and they're not super cheap. But the easiest way to do this is to simply take several tennis balls and put them into a long sock. Like a sock for a soccer sock, what you wear for soccer would be great. This would not work with ankle socks. Now, just to talk, just to, to repeat what Scott said, part of what works so well here is that when you work through your your movement, as long as there's rhythm that's happening between your lower body and coordinating with the upper body, you can't control what the weight of the sock does. So in this position, you can see that the sock is moving from right to left. This is initiating just like it did. On the drill. previous, yeah, and, and yesterday's drill. And so from here, once it reaches what would be the power position, right? This is, and this is your archer's pose. This, this is exactly what we want to see here in the serve, right? Want to measure that from the, the tossing hand to the hitting elbow. You have no control of the tennis balls of where it's going because of gravity, all right? But what you do have control, let me get that zoomed in just a little bit, is how to get the, 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 weighted sock back up in the air so let's focus on the feet here so this is what scott was just talking about with the pulse-up drill as the feet push down through the ground and that energy is transferred up so is the weighted sock okay and from here you can see that it extends out but pay attention to what's happening with my heel here right my, my heel is off the ground because i'm distributing weight up now I'm going to play this a little bit. Now, at the end of it, to do this exercise, you want to cup your hand. You want the palm to finish up and then just bring it around. Now, you'll notice here as I'm working through this, my eyes start up. From here, my eyes are up because that's where I want to focus the attention. I want this going up. And this is just a really good exercise to get that rhythm we were talking about for the racket drop. Yep. Yeah, the fluidity here is everything, guys, right? If we, we talk a lot about not placing your racket somewhere, so when we talk about this racket drop, we don't want you to feel like you're just going here and just putting your racket down your back. It needs to be this fluid motion, and this drill really helps you kind of get uh, 
get in the rhythm. And it's been around forever. But here's the thing. Like, if you don't buy into it, check out the pros before they play. When they're warming up, you'll see them with, you know, Sometimes devices rackets, or yeah. Yeah, multiple rackets uh, to, to incorporate rope. this. So the next exercise we're going to talk about is the three finger drill. That um, you so rudely spoiled on both day one and day two. So probably everybody has been here is sort of aware it. already. All right. So now that we've got the racket in the hand, you want to make sure that you're taking away the tension. All right. You want to talk to them a little bit about the why this works? Yeah, this is extremely important, guys. We talk about this a lot, um, both for injury prevention and for more power. If you're tight in your hand or in your forearm, you're not going to be able to create the rhythmic serve, the rhythmic motion that we need to hit a big serve. So a lot of players struggle with this. They struggle with just the right tension for how to hold their racket grip. And so what this drill does is it just forces you to relax your grip by taking your bottom two fingers completely off. Now, this is going to feel very wobbly in your hands, very loose, too loose. And that's good because we want you to feel what too loose feels like and then rein it back in versus too tight. So the concept here is you take the very similar figure eight drill pattern that Nate was just showing you with the weighted sock drill and you replace the sock with your racket and hold it with three fingers and get comfortable swinging and hitting serves with just three fingers. Yep. Um, step one is really just to take a couple serves and, and, and well, I guess step one is well, probably step swing one. with yeah, three so, fingers. So yeah. step one, we have multiple stages here, but step one with this three finger is, is take this Take this in, in, in kind of micro doses, right? Like start slow and then build up on it. Right. But what you'll see here, as I'm loading through the ground and the elbow's firing up to the ball, because my two fingers are off the racket, you see how the racket has that waggle at the end? It, it has to drop because gravity. Yeah. Right? And I'm not creating any tension. So there's... Yeah, so guys, for all of you that have ever struggled to have that racket drop and point towards the ground, the issue is more than likely tension in your hand. And this drill releases that tension to the point where when you're loosely holding the racket with three fingers, when your arm goes up, the racket has to do this. Now, if I had all five fingers on and I was tight, the racket may only get to right here. So you can see the second I release these two fingers, you're going to see my elbow fly up and my racket drop, right? And then, then you're going to see this waggle effect that Nate's showing you here so one more in time the video. Here. Just kind of, Let's go real time here so you can see the speed of it. But so firing through the legs... The two fingers are off. So the racket not only gets into a good racket drop, but it should come back around because there's nothing blocking it. So step one here is really just get used to the feel of, hey, if you had no tension in your hand, you're naturally going to get a racket drop. Step right. two, we're going to start hitting some serves, right? So three, um, well, let's before, because we got this last time we did the, a, a challenge. Um, and I saw it in the comments uh, both days, day one, day two, people were talking about rhythm. Yep. Right. Because like this, this is a little bit rhythm dependent. If you're too far forward or you're too far back, it's hard to kind of create a natural pendulum that the racket will create. So what we'll notice here is I'll let this play through. Sorry I'm, about the airplane noise, guys. We are live here and we are in a military town. So every once in a while, you get an F-18 right over your head. That is the sound of freedom, That's folks. Right. Sound of freedom. Those are our airplanes. So you want to make sure that your weight starts forward. All right. So what you'll see here is I'm shaking my foot out because there's no weight on it. And then the weight distributes to the back foot. So I'm picking my front foot up because there's very little weight on that front foot. Now, as, as I'm going forward, you, know, you see there's no weight on the back foot. Now, you gotta bounce the ball. So the way this starts is you're bouncing on your front foot, then your back foot, and then your front foot. Now, for some people, that cadence throws, they, you off. It throws, throws them off, especially for some people that are pinpoint. So you can go Serena. You know, Serena started on the back foot. She skipped the stage. Just back foot to front foot. Sampras did as well, right? He had the little... Exactly. Yeah, toe up. Started on the back foot, worked to the front foot. But the main thing is that you you want to make sure that you're distributing weight forward, right? So on the serve, you want to make sure that you're going at least back to front, right? You're just going from back foot to front foot, and then really whether you're platform or pinpoint, loading off of both feet. The reason this matters so much is in order to get the racket moving and keep it moving, you're going to keep this rocking mo motion that we're talking about. Um, before we kind of discuss what's going on here, I just pay attention to the rocking of the feet. Wait, is this the same? Yep, here's where we're going. 
So here again, I'm, I'm showing you the feet and the weight distribution. All right. And then as I go into swinging the rocket with the three finger technique, you can see if you just kind of focus here, how the feet are the heel driving toe, mechanism. Heel toe, yep. So if you just do this with your arm, you're not going to find the connection with your hip to your shoulder. So make sure that you're focusing on getting this whole thing moving with the lower body. And again, if you're in a place where you can swing a tennis racket right now, get up, stand up as you're watching us here and play around with this a little bit. Because once you get this synced, I feel like there's this aha moment and it just kind of works. And so here's just from the front view, because we get asked this a lot, like, well, how do you keep it moving? So I'll pause right here. When the racket comes around, it gets to this point, that would be your natural follow through. All right, just pull it back around, but keep it moving. So you can see there immediately I dropped it down. And this is easier with the three fingers on the racket. Two two fingers and a thumb. Yep. We got for anyone that's trying to troll on that out there. somehow. Yeah. Um, can I break it down for the folks that are less smart like myself to make this even simpler? Get it. So I think a lot of you are probably sitting at home or in your office right now and looking at this and saying, that looks so fluid. Can you give me some checkpoints to figure out how to sync this up? So if you'll sort of manually walk us through your motion, I'm going to walk them through what's happening. So as Nate's arms drop, that is when his front toe is popping up and all of his weight is shifted to his heel. So let's say that again. I want to make sure we cover this slowly enough where this really sets in. So when, when Nate's bringing his arms down and that racket arm comes down, he is rocking his weight into his right butt cheek and his back heel. So there's no weight on this front foot, and that's when you're going to see the toe pop. So go back uh, to the beginning of the stroke. You get a little ahead of us here. Sorry, sorry. So you can see as he's dropping, the toe starting to pop up, his weight starting to shift back into his back foot. All right, and, and again, just as, as we're, I guess I missed step one. Step one is when Nate starts, when he lines up, all of his weight is on his front foot. He could shake that back heel because all of his weight is here on his front foot, and his weight is sort of forward. As the arms drop, you see, sorry, as the arms drop, you see everything shifts back. And you can tell because the toe starts to pop, everything's going to shift back to the back foot and his weight's really in his like right glute. All right. As that tossing arm goes up, you see the weight shifts somewhat evenly. It's not all on the left foot, right? It's yeah. maybe 70, 30 on the left. You got it. Um, but he's sitting down into a chair. So as arms go up, legs are going down, and weight's getting a little bit more equally distributed with more of it being on the front foot. And then he pushes from his back foot, which activates the hip and the racket drop. So if you're needing checkpoints there to sort of figure out when each of these pieces happen, there they are for you. You want to try to get off of both feet equally. Right. I know that we're saying like a 70-30 disparity, and that's especially for like a pinpoint. You want to try to get weight off both feet. Now, what you'll notice, what, what Scott's talking about is as the weight starts coming forward, you'll see my back heel start to lift. And although the weight's on that front foot, that's the back foot activating, activating. the hip. Yeah, from the toe. And, and the front foot's not moving here because it's, it's just an exercise through the arm if I'm actually hitting a serve. We're on a little bit of a jump. delay here, and I know there's questions on this. So start to throw questions here in the comments if you have anything on anything we've covered so far. But I would imagine a lot of them are going to be on just syncing everything up that we've just talked about. So start to throw some of your uh, your, your questions in the comments section, and we'll, we'll get to as many of them as we can. I got to throw this up on the screen. Our boy Roberto in Costa Rica says, my serve was 110 miles an hour, and now with your tips, I'm serving 118 miles an hour. We only have <laughs> – Let's go. I can't do the math on that. If we're adding 15 miles per hour, we've already added eight. We have seven more miles to go, Roberto. We'll get you there. That's awesome, man. That's sick. All right. You want to move on here as the questions well, start to flow in? And to be clear, it's kind of like pitching, right? Sure, I'm chewing ice. I'm super rude. <laughs> oh, you're, on, you're live right now. Oh, no. Right? I need a water, but I just got some ice, whatever. <laughs> um, At least they can't hear you chewing in, in, that live on the internet right now. In pitching, you know, most pitchers can throw 90 miles per hour, but like getting above that is super, super hard. When you hit the three digit club, yeah, you're every right. 10 miles per hour increment is like deal. being Randy Johnson, and I could show my age, and being able to throw 103 as compared to like a Greg Maddox that could throw like 95. Who do you, who do you like more, Randy Johnson or Babe Ruth? Which, which did you enjoy watching on television more growing up? 
<laughs> All right. So we didn't show you actually hitting old. <laughs> hitting balls with the serve now. This is the fun part. Now, what I want you to do, a couple of these I'll miss. It's cool. Get out here and just kind of like rapid fire this. Toss the ball up and work through the figure eight drill and just focus or insane loose. I'm showing that I've only got the three fingers, two fingers and a thumb on the racket. Kenny, our main man on the video is, is, is working around it. But you'll see here is we've just, had a lot of people in our workshops ask us if they're allowed to just serve with three fingers because they finally got the racket drop and they got more acceleration with holding the racket with three fingers and more powerful serve just because all the tension finally was released. The answer, unfortunately, is no. We'd like yeah. you to get those fingers back on there because eventually the racket's going to fly out of your hand. But if you have, if you struggle with tension and getting that full racket drop, this is going to be the drill that uh, that hopefully changes that for you. Yeah. Yep. So we told you today's a relatively short one. Maybe we'll open the floor for for some questions. But this is all about connecting it because it's one thing to comprehend it; it's a total another thing to feel it. Yeah. In tennis, you have to feel what you're doing in order to make it your own. You know, the, the old outliers, 10,000 hours, whether it's true or not. Um, at some point in ownership of your game, you're connected to the ball through feel, and you stop thinking about all these moving parts. But so this today is about understanding what the rocket should be doing and then feeling it. For sure. Guys, continue to throw some questions in here. I've got three or four already. It's a bit skimpy in here. I know the content today, uh, hopefully it's not terribly complicated. I think day two is really hard, and then day three, you know, this stuff makes sense. You just maybe haven't heard mm -hmm. it before. So what I am going to do, because I've had a couple of people ask this already. Yes, we do teach live workshops. Um, and we got kind of a lot of stuff going on that you might want to see. So I'll just throw this here and you guys just sort of grab this link and do with it what you will. Um, we've got a serve workshop out in Indian Wells that some of you may want to attend during the BNP Preba Open. And also while we're out there, we're doing a doubles workshop with the Brian brothers, actually two days of it. So Such Brian brothers winning his double team of all time. If you want to jump out on court with us and them and have them sort of pick apart uh, the doubles errors that, that you're making that are preventing you from winning as many grand slams as you can. That's, that's the right workshop. So and it, 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 I mean, they're incredible. I'm not, I'm not just saying just to sell good, the clinic good dudes, I mean, but also good. I've been teaching tennis for longer than I care to admit to my age here, but longer but than I mean, computers have existed. He, hearing them talking about, <laughs> Certain concepts. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm learning stuff where I'm like, ah, yeah. I, how about that? Yeah, shocker that winning a double yeah. team of all time. We could learn something from. Them. I know you thought we were yeah. really smart, but yeah. greatest double team of all time teaching. Yeah, yeah. So I'm gonna take this link down. Uh, you don't need to remember this or write this down somewhere. If you just go to playercourt.com in the upper navigation bar, there's like a more information section. Private clinics is where you want to go if you're trying to get out on court with us or the Brian brothers. All right, shall we dive into some of these questions here? Let's get it. Um, Robert says, when you move your elbow forward slash up to the ball at the racket drop, is your elbow at 45 degrees to the baseline? Will you show him video footage of yeah. that exact angle? And Robert, I'm going to take your question off the screen here so you can see the instruction. Yeah, uh, find the footage here. Keep talking, Scott. You're doing a good job. <laughs> I don't have anything else to say. All right, so let's check out Curious. So this is going to vary on, on some serves, depending on style. But what you're going to see is the elbow is coming up, right? It's in a 90 degree. I mean, that, that's truly where we, we – that is the holy grail. That's, that's what dream, we would yeah. we'd like to see. This is the best see. server on tour. Yeah. And this is all happening behind him, so it's a bit parallel. I know we're talking about, you know, degrees. I'm not quite – if you're saying is, is the arm 45 degrees, for most of us, yeah. But this is where we would like it to be. If you look at Federer here – platform different style all together as his elbow travels up right it's not quite the 90 degrees that we saw with with um with Karius. right now he's also hitting a kick serve to the ad court so that'll change it a little bit but there will there'll be different degrees of of what we see now i'll put, I'll put myself to the test oh no, man we actually got people in here trolling you already i'm going to put those questions up on the screen so my favorite that's fine <laughs> bring it Bring it on internet. You can't hurt me. I have a YouTube channel. I hear mean stuff every day. <laughs> that's right. Teflon at this point. All right. Oh, that's good. <laughs> All right. So 
we're going to do the serve in the deuce court, abbreviate it, Give them serve, a zoom in. serve more. I mean, this is, this is how I'm serving today. I'm, I'm, as I said in day one, eliminated the pendulum where I think most players benefit from. That's what we see the serve doing. Less moving parts, less that can go wrong, right? But so as I'm working up to this, up, oh, working up to the serve. So leave this video on the screen when you're done with this because the next question we can answer with the same footage. So blurry because it's so fast. I'm totally kidding, but pretty close to 90, right? Pretty close to 90. Um, right, and that's going to that, that's gonna vary, right? Uh, but everyone's different, but I think that's where you want to aim towards is, is 90 degrees. For sure, for sure. Robert, hopefully that helps. Um, Dennis, pull that same video up because this is going to answer the same question. So uh, shouldn't you be on the balls of your feet to better push upwards? Your demo looks a bit flat-footed. So when we were showing the demo of the uh, three-finger drill, my, my guess is your feet look flat-footed because we did it in super slow motion. Yeah. Um, but when you actually walk up to the – you go. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. You got to no. defend yourself. I'm actually, I'm actually going to show you. Dennis, with, I'm going to take your question down here, but we're answering it right now. I'm going to show you two serves if this downloads. Oh, I got it because – Internet's hard. Nope, I just, there we go. Got all my notifications turned off. So here in the title, it's it's no jump, all right? And, and the reason this is important is we've been talking about in the last few days about loading, okay? So can you hit 100 miles per hour serve without jumping? Can you hit 100 miles Absolutely. per hour serve from your legs, from your knees? Yeah, can you hit 100 miles per hour serve from your knees? Yeah, you can, right? So what I found, what Scott has found, you know, we, we taught, in our own career separately, and then we joined forces. But we have a lot of the same notes in that jumping interferes with the vast majority of players below four or five. They, it actually messes up their serve Not instead of helping. Not even creeping to 5-0s, honestly. I've taken the jump out of college tennis players' serve and have that hit bigger. So just focusing on what's happening with the hands and taking the feet out of it, you'll see there, like, my feet getting up? Sure. Right? I'm hitting over 100 miles per hour? I hope so. Um, <laughs> but the idea here, as I work through this now, is we know my feet, we know we're loaded because my knees are bent, right? And as that energy comes up, you'll see that, I mean, you can slide a credit card under there. But what does it do to the racket, <laughs> right? What does it do to the racket? It's actually am I at full Yeah, and am I at full extension? Yep. So for a lot of players, eliminating the jumping all of a sudden they're gonna be like oh my god i can't believe how much harder i'm hitting the serve because you're not having something that's interfering with it now should you jump sure right like here we see like a more traditional and here i'm demonstrating the platform and so through the platform now we see more activation to where i don't know four inches maybe and then the traditional land on the left foot and the right foot kick back. If you can do that and it doesn't disrupt your serve, absolutely. And your, and your knees. I mean, we've talked a ton about this. When we get tired in the third set with both of us having knee injuries, you're not going to see that same elevation. Like, There's absolutely a, medi a middle ground here where you can get 90% of the same power without your feet even leaving the ground. Yeah. So if a lot of this, to, to, uh, to clarify, to help, when we're doing demos and we're talking through the hands, we're not worried about jumping or anything because with the focus for 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 you guys while you're watching is is to focus on like what's happening to upper body. But as we will talk on day four and day five more, because that's when we start talking about the lower body, we're going to talk more about this. Probably just pulled some content, but it's okay. Yeah. But loading, well, loading is the key. Not it's not about how high you jump. This is true. All right, moving right along here, Matthew Wilson would like to know: Do you have any thoughts on both feet remaining relatively in place? Throughout the wind up versus the step in with the back foot, step in, I would assume, meaning pinpoint. Yeah, it sounds like just platform pinpoint. Yeah. Totally fine. Here I'm demonstrating platform, and you'll see like feet aren't moving until I'm jumping. Yep. Right. Uh, totally cool. Nothing, it's just preference. Yeah, Matthew, to, I'll throw your question back up here again just so everybody can see it. Um, you'll find pros that do either yeah. or. There's no right or wrong here. It's personal preference. Both are great. There are plenty of people who serve at 130 miles per hour using both platform where their feet don't move or pinpoint where that back foot slides up. So not a problem, my dude. And you can even be mon fees and just start with your feet kind of close together and not pull the foot up at all, but not really truly be platform. Perfect, yep. cool. um, this is a quick one from Derek. Uh, what's the best tool to measure speed you all have used? I think I like swing vision. You got a better one? 
Ah, uh, that's probably I would say probably it's kind of like the only one. Yeah, yeah. I, I would know say what else there is. I mean, they're all gonna have until you get out with an actual speed gun. They're all gonna have affiliate link. Uh, yeah. Swing vision. What's up? Call swing vision. Um, and tell them that Scott and Nate said nice things about them. They're all gonna have until you actually get out with a radar gun. They're all gonna have degrees of of, of, of variant, right? I mean, they're gonna be off a little bit. Swing vision's um, pretty good. Pretty accurate. It's pretty accurate. It's like um, surprisingly accurate because it's just an iPhone app that you hang up on the phone behind the behind the fence and it, it pretty pretty freaking close yeah i think that's probably the one you want to check out yeah all right uh until someone pays us more money to say otherwise <laughs> <laughs> now we're just telling where that's not a spot like <laughs> we we uh we have no uh, uh, we don't play those games yeah we don't get paid by swing vision that's our honest thought and i hope everyone out there knows that we give you our honest opinion there's not not me i'm stuff. totally for sale <laughs> Um, Christopher Pollock, uh, what is what going up, on, Chris? my man? Um, give us some tips slash drills on combining the swing with the toss. I have students who excel at both independently, combine the two, and swing changes to the toss. Often waiters tray returns. So, I mean, this is this is really the biggest problem coaches yeah. are going to run into is like the individual parts look beautiful, and then you you bake the whole cake together, and it just doesn't taste good anymore, right? So. Yeah. So do you want to talk a little bit about this? I mean, we, we really start to sync this up a bit more tomorrow, but maybe you can give some teaser, some teaser content on this final drill that we just did. Yeah. Take the target out of it. Uh, let me get back in here to day three. Take the target out of it. So here I'm not concerned with whether where the ball goes, right? I'm just trying to focus on keeping the racket moving and staying loose. And because it's kind of rapid fire, I don't get this nervy piece to where I'm like, oh, where's my toss? What's happening with my tossing arm? Because I think that's what happens with a lot of people is they start trying to put the two together. Um, the other thing that, well, we talk about the contact point tomorrow. So you got to stay tuned for that, Chris. Um, but, but as far as putting it together, that's, that's kind of everybody's thing or issue. But that's why we put, did all these drills today is that you've got to be willing to segment them in order to put it together. And what we find is that too many players are like, yeah, 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 I, mean, I want to hit. I want to, I want to put it in action. Well, if you can't do right to left and you can't get your elbow up to the ball. Then right? you can't serve 100 miles an hour. Well, well, and you can't, you shouldn't, we're not here yet. Yeah. Right? So I would always, regressions, progressions. Any coach that that is... How do I say this? Any coach that is uh, that is worth their money, worthwhile, should be working in progressions and regressions. Like it's like yeah, like if you haven't mastered the continental grip, talking about the racket drop is, is not the right sequence of events yet. Yeah, it's like scaling a mountain. You got to have base camp, right? You got to have base camp. You got to be able to come back to try to get back up and come back down to come back up. This is actually a good question here from Dick. So we haven't covered this at all. And I'm just realizing this is kind of a miss. So he's asking, are you striking the ball at one o'clock? We've talked a lot about how far out in front to throw the toss. We didn't actually talk about 12 versus one. That's because it's day four, the oh, contact. Oh <laughs> man, my bad. All right. So we can't answer that yet, Dick, I guess, right? And between 12 and one. Now 12, you you can. We're four, talking about four flat, flat, flat and slice yeah, we're 12 you can, but you've got to be careful because you're extending the, the head of the shoulder and you can get into impingement here. You can find some pretty good power at 12 o'clock. Um, Ideally, you're you're hitting somewhere between twelve thirty and one. One is going to be optimal. But I mean, if I show you, I'll go back to uh, Curios here in due time. I mean, you can see when his racket comes through at contact right there. Now he's hitting a kicker, to be fair, but he's not at one o'clock. Right, no. I mean, he's, he's operating closer to twelve than he is at one, but that's because it's also a kicker. But so the the rule is between twelve and one, um, twelve thirty. I think listing about, more towards twelve, even eleven thirty for kickers. Listing more towards one for flat and slice. Yeah, I kind of like twelve thirty because I feel like most people when they aim for one, they end up at one thirty and yeah, they slice fair. the heck out of the ball. That's fair. Um, CB, you're not going to like this answer. We are specifically doing this exact instruction tomorrow, so tune in tomorrow. Um, or by dun, the recordings dun, dun. and tune in whenever you'd like. Sorry, CB. But um, I love but your yeah. Calvin and Hobbes. Yes, we are very specifically talking about an exact drill to make sure the edge goes up towards the ball tomorrow. Uh, we don't want to confuse the people with too much info today, but we will cover that tomorrow on day four. Promise. Um, all right, defend yourself. 
It appears that you take your racket down together and up together. I thought your tossing arm is supposed to go up before your racket. Do as I say. Not, Not as, as I, I do. do. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're um, in the... I know what he's talking about. So in the three finger technique. Yeah, you're not as focused on your tossing hand. Yeah. So that's not what we're filming. Really. Now, now here, what you'll see is that I am abbreviated. I'm not going with the racket tip all the way down, but here, in order to find it being loose, it's a little bit easier to get a shallow dip. So think like aim for your waist here and then keep it moving. When we talk about a true pendulum, Uh, let's see here. There we go. So when we talk about a true pendulum, we'll get to where they show Pete here from the full serve. So see here with Pete, how the racket tip is all the way down at the bottom. This is what we're referring to when we say like a full pendulum. And then the racket is coming all the way, I mean, what a crazy lag on this too. And then it's coming all the way back up. So it's got to, it's, it's got to literally travel, you know, all the way from down here and then drop and then flip out. Um, or keeping loose for the three finger, I would let it drop to the waist. And then when you're trying to hit serves, you can find whatever you're comfortable with. You can either start from the right to left and draw the elbow back, or you can go ahead and drop to the waist and come up. So waist, and then moving up, that's what we're talking about when we look at like the, the Corda serve, Bublik. I mean, we could go on and on about how many Caroline Garcia, how many serves are abbreviated now as opposed to trying to drop all the way down. Tennis 979, hopefully that helps. Um, your girl Beth Coolis in here saying, Hey, nice what's things. up, Beth? Went after my serve today in my club fun match and used the more abbreviated motion and saw a definite improvement. Love to hear that. Yes. That's awesome, Beth. I love hearing that. Nice jump serve, Nate. Thank Thanks. you, Hal. Thanks. Uh, right. Um, let's see here. So we should address this. Uh, Dick asks, why do we see such a big drop off on our second serve? So I'll give the really like the really novice answer, and then you can get into the the technical big brain sure. answer. Uh, risk reward, right? You only get two chances, so you're going to swing bigger at the first one and take more risk. Uh, the second one, the goal is. You know, to get the ball in, and I think at that point start the point out neutral or better. So you're just going to see really at all levels of play, hopefully, um, players going for more on their first serve. And then similar technique, um, but with a little bit less racket head speed or maybe imparting a little bit more spin with the same racket head speed on the second serve. That's it. I mean, that's the key. If you're decelerating on your second serve, that's a big no-no. Um, you know, it's like we'll pick on the min here for a little bit because that's what we see a lot. Like, the dude that, that that just absolutely crushes the first serve and then dinks in the second serve and then talks about how they hit four aces through the match, but yeah. they hit 80% Skips second serve. Skips leg to that guy. <laughs> that guy. <laughs> um, on, on your second serve, it's about winning core position. So it's all about keeping the same acceleration but importing, imparting a lot more spin. If you don't have the spin, I mean, your, your margin for error is going to drop and you're just going to end up double faulting. So that's why the serve typically drops off. But if you watch the pros, there's also a reason why the returners typically Can I interject one thing? So I want to make sure yeah. people hear this because what you just touched on, you, you addressed it quickly, but it's really important. At our level and at the rec level, if, if you're doing it correctly, you can keep swinging as fast as you do on your first serve because we hit tight, right? Like it's hitting a second serve is nerve wracking. It's a lot scarier than hitting your first serve because there's a lot more consequence to it if you miss. So we tighten up. And this is why, as coaches, we recommend spin serves because it allows you to just let the racket go and swing out like you were at your first serve. But imparting spin, either slice or kick, is what's going to keep that ball on the court. So when you're nervous, you're able to just still swing out at the ball, and that's why spin's so useful. Sorry. Yeah, no, I mean that's that, that's it, everything, right? Don't decelerate on your second serve, yep. especially you doubles players out there. I would, I, you, you can use the fast serve as a changeup, but like if you're having issues where your second serve is just getting slaughtered focus on the second hit two second serves and just focus on accelerating more and getting more spin for sure for sure all right we got a lot in here so i'm going to try and keep moving um richard asks do you use wrist to create the whip effect unconsciously 
Don't try to don't use your wrist. About it, but yes. Yeah. The wrist, I mean, th this is the gift of the serve, right? Like the wrist is the piece of anatomy that allows for this snap. But the wrist snap occurs because of pronation. And that's something that we're going to talk about in the next two days. We'll talk about this heavily tomorrow. I mean, the, can I tease them? The, yeah. the, the teaser is when you swing to full extension. I'm going to get down here so you can see this. When you swing to full extension, your wrist has to sort of turn over, right? If, if I get my arm moving and I swing at full extension, this wrist has to flop over. It's not that I'm thinking about snapping down on the ball with my wrist, and I, and I have heard coaches give that instruction. I, I don't think it's great. I think if you think about swinging with acceleration up towards full extension, you're going to naturally get that wrist snap. So the answer is yes, but you shouldn't be thinking about using the wrist. You should be thinking about getting to full extension and just letting that happen, right? 100%. Cool. All right, a couple more here from Tennis979. Is it better to keep your eyes on the contact point slightly longer than you are before looking forward? Two thumbs up, 100%. I, I love... I was ready for you to say, yes, next question. <laughs> you um, in curious mode here? Yeah, just, just real quick. You guys get to watch me navigate your iPad. Yeah. Um, I'll tease what Nate's, I think, getting ready to show is that when Nick Kyrgios starts to serve, he actually starts with his head looking up and it sort of stays there until contact. So the idea of keeping everything up, I'll let you show it. So I Check out Nick here. Say it. Zoom in a little bit. Thank you. Let me, there we go. So just focus on his head. And as this plays, I'll play it in slow motion. He's, he doesn't need to look down at his racket. I mean, Kenan has issues with her serve from looking down and then trying to look up. Here's a big thing. If you have a hitch with your toss, if you look down and you try to get everything moving and then your eyes start to climb, this is where we get this like hitch to where we jerk and the ball goes somewhere. But as Nick works through his motion, his head never moves. He's just looking at the place he wants the ball to go, right? And I mean, and all the way through the racket drop, yeah, the head's not moving. <laughs> Just staying in one like place. Like a robot. Yeah, and then it finally turns as his arm starts to come around. So trying to watch the contact point longer than you need to, absolutely. That's a great I think holding your tidbit. tossing arm up in the air as long as you can also helps with this, right? Because one of the biggest problems we see when we start to talk about head drop or arm drop is you pull everything down, and that, as you can imagine, leads to hitting in the net. So keeping the head up, keeping the arm up, big wins. Uh, we've got time for probably like two or three more here. Um, let's address this one because I'm sure this is, I'm sure Steve is not the only person um, struggling with some some pain here. So Steve says, I'm 72 years young. I love that. But I have arthritis in my knees, so I can't do the knee bend so much. How can I still increase my surf power? We have arthritis too. Chondromalacia, meniscus issues. I mean, you name it. It goes back to the loading, what we were talking about earlier. Don't worry about jumping. Just load that energy down and really focus on the rear pelvic tilt. If you do this, you can... If you can get even a little push off the ground, but you can rock your shoulders back and get the power from the cartwheel, you don't need even as much force from your feet. So, you know, in Steve's situation, I don't know how bad it is, Steve. If you're to the point where, like, it literally hurts to push into the ground with your, your back foot, then you're going to have to find power in other places, like Nate talked about, rear pelvic tilt, getting those shoulders, and it's going to feel a little bit fake without the knee bend, but it's still it's still plausible. And we're going to talk about internal shoulder rotation, about how that is so important. Um, some coaches will disagree, but the internal shoulder rotation is a big piece because it's part of pronation. Um, but like we said earlier, like you can hit a really big serve from your knees, right? So you don't have to necessarily jump. But we'll, the, the loading piece is huge. We'll talk about that more in the next couple of days. I don't know if this is going to fit on the screen or if I can read all of it, but I'm going to try. Because it's really nice. <laughs> um, this is just a nice. I don't, I don't know. People are saying nice things. We'll, we'll, we'll call them out. This, this is a this is a life lesson. If you're nice, people will pay attention to you. Um, I tried everything you taught on day one and day two, especially focused on the right to left racket swing technique when I played doubles last night. I also changed my grip because my palm pad was not on bevel two. It was further around the back. It took a few service games to get it down, but then the results and improvements were huge. More power, consistency, and spin. I love it. This is why I live. Yeah, I was smiling the whole time. Man. You can't see because of the comment, but it was uh, that's awesome. I, I mean, that's it. that's why we do this. This is why we're putting this stuff out there, right? The game is more enjoyable when you're not worried about serving. For sure, for sure. 
All right, we've got time. Man, there are a lot more in here. Um, Pick your favorite, Scott. No, no, I don't want anybody to think that's happening. Um, all right, we're you know what? We'll we'll answer them all. How about that? That's not true. We're not going to have time to do that. But we're going to answer a lot of them. Let's let's so bring your uh, hey, John. Bring your short-winded answers to the table now. Let's try and crank through some of these. So John says, I have a fairly technically sound serve. My first serve usually ranges from 100 to 110 miles per hour, but occasionally I'll get up to 120. That's a big serve. The only thing about my serve that doesn't look perfect is my back foot doesn't flare up like all of the pros in that scorpion tail shape. I do bend my knees and jump. Any ideas if this is a rhythm or weight transfer issue? So he's just saying when if he's right-handed, when he lands on that left foot, his back foot's not kicking up. Yeah. So here's the thing. As we said before, I mean, if you're hitting consistently in a, at 110 um, and, and occasionally getting into that 120, trying to incorporate that may be more dis disruptive than it's helpful. Um, but I, I get it. Like we we, we want we kind of always want what we, we don't have. What I would focus on, not not necessarily identifying because I, I we without seeing it, we can't identify 100 percent what the problem is. But here's my my thought. If you focus on jumping up to a platform, so you know we always use uh, wrestling mats. They're they're about I don't know, probably about five inches. If you shadow your motion and you just focus on landing on your left foot, the scorpion tail is going to happen no matter what. Yep. All right. So focus. I would just start in working on that and seeing if you can incorporate it in, and then see what that does to the serve. You consistently hit in the one twenty, then awesome. You know. Um, my, my guess is he's not even going to see a whole lot of lifts to power. It's just going to look cooler. So don't don't always assume, you know, it doesn't have to look yeah. perfect. If my scorpion tail is not range, is not massive anymore. I have a, a torn labrum in the, the left tip. I have impingement. It wrecked my like knee. That, yeah. yeah, it just it's like I'm not going to get through a singles match or a doubles match at this point. Um, constantly focusing on like the serve that I had collegiately at, at playing at a, at, a, at a much higher level. I mean, it's, it was 65, 70 years ago. Yeah. So, you know, we want to make, <laughs> I hate you. <laughs> I didn't even get to one. All right. Next question. What do we have? Let's get it. All right. Do you recommend changing the grip? The funniest part is Nate's like four years older than I am, but I always make fun six. of him. I'm six years older than you. Um, even better. Uh, do you recommend changing the grip more to a backhand grip for the second serve to get more spin? So, I'll cover this one briefly. So, Stefan Edberg. Yeah, we talked a lot about the continental grip is your index knuckle. I need to move this so you can see me. Sorry. Uh, the continental grip is your index knuckle on bevel two, your heel pad also on bevel two. Uh, this is a great question. If you slide your heel pad more towards bevel three, it does sort of open you up to hit bigger slice and bigger kick serve. So, yes, this is an option. And yes, it's personal preference. It's not mandatory. Not all players do this. There's yeah. plenty of players use a true continental on bevel two for their index and their heel pad that have huge kick serves and huge slice serves. But if you struggle to generate spin, shifting the heel pad one bevel over to the side of the racket while maintaining that index knuckle on bevel two is a way to generate naturally more spin. Yeah. I mean, Ed Berg, Try and add something to that. Ray Nitch, yeah. If it works for you, cool. Uh, but, but yeah, you don't have to, but it's, it's more of a personal preference. If you're personal struggling preference. to generate spin, that is maybe an unlock for some folks. Um, this is a similar question, but as it relates to other strokes, so the grip heel pad change is huge. And guys, just to, just to recap, cause this is huge. What we're talking about, most players here, the continental grip is just this index knuckle on bevel two, and they never learn that their heel pad is supposed to be on that same bevel. So that's what we're talking about right now. So what Jim is asking is, is this the same concept when you're holding the racket for ground strokes? And the answer is absolutely yes. Right. When you're like when you're trying to learn a semi-western forehand grip, and this is not a semi-western forehand challenge, but we'll give you some bonus content. You know, we're, coaches are going to tell you to pick the racket up with the V of your hand on top, and what that's actually doing here, and it's going to be really hard for you to see from there, is it's putting my index bevel, sorry, my index knuckle on bevel one, two, three, four, and then if I flip my hand over here, you can see my heel pad also on bevel four. So same concept, Eastern forehand grip, same situation. My index knuckle here, even with my strings, my heel pad, same thing. So absolutely yes, um, with the ability to move around a little bit, just depending yeah. on what we're the talking about. The bevels are, are, are wide, so there's, there's going to be variation. But yeah, pay attention to where your heel pad is on the bevel. Serving into the sun. 
No, I'm not. Next question. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, we should address this. So yeah. um, there's usually a toss adjustment or there's sunglasses or a hat and powerful eyes involved. You, yeah. you talk to me about, about the adjustment. I, I'm the guy that just sucks it up and just puts the ball where it goes and just looks into the sun and is a little bit blinded for like half a second. I was fortunate through juniors and, and collegiately to, to play with a lefty, so we were able to navigate this pretty well. Um, if you're totally stuck, you don't have, you know, you, there's no choice. You're serving into the sun. You don't have sunglasses. You don't have a hat. Um, I think a lot of times it's, it's choosing the serve that's keeping the sun out of your eyes the most. So maybe it's a kicker where you're getting the ball back behind you. We're not having to look at it quite so much. Maybe uh, to me, a lot of times I feel like I've used a slider because I don't have to get the toss up quite so high. It's a little bit more consistent uh, because of the spin. Um, but yeah, uh, you can't serve the same that you would with without the sun. I mean, that's toss as close as you can without blinding yourself. Yeah, right? I mean, I think that's and it can be a little bit like a windy day. On a windy day, if you have a big high toss, yeah, not great, go well. right? So, and if the sun is directly high noon, you know, and you have a big high toss and you're looking into it, not great. You may have to play with the height of your toss as well. For sure, for sure. All right, guys, we're running a little bit over here. We're gonna do one more. Uh, Robert, you were the lucky winner here. Thoughts on landing on your right foot when you move into the court. There have been a number of players who have done this, uh, for example, Becker. So the idea that we talked about when we were talking about the scorpion tail, that's usually with, uh, for, for right-handed players, their right foot. And they're landing on their left. Thoughts on doing the reverse of that? I would never teach it, but I, I had a gentleman that I was doing video analysis for through our community that was a 5-0 player and, you know, I think in his early 50s, and that's how he landed. And I, I also would never correct it. If that's something that is natural because of the error or just however you learned, all good, all good. But but taking a player that is, you know, trying to advance their serve that's not playing at an open level, I, I, would, I would stay away from it because I think the weight distribution in, can be a little bit – uh, tough. Now, I, I don't have a problem. So summary is you would never teach it, but if you saw it happening, you might not correct it in a very rare circumstance. Yeah. The only thing I will so add to that. Effectively, don't do that. Yeah. If you, you don't learn that way, right? right. But if um, I do have players that have total issues with with hips, knees, whatever, and like you were talking about, uh, loading is an issue, and they actually step through with the right foot. Sometimes that's the only option. Right, and it's keeping it's. It turns into more of a pitching motion. Uh, you you you, do, you work with what you have for sure. Right, so sometimes we don't correct that, but everybody's a case by case. If we can land on the left, kick up. We've the seen right. some crazy things, but yeah, I mean, if you want to talk template out of the box, we don't recommend it. Yeah, um, guys, I, I I know we push this on you hard. One, we are a for profit business, so of course it's helpful if, if we generate revenue on these things as we do these free challenges. But more importantly, for real, more importantly. You're not going to remember all this stuff. It's just not possible. We're covering a very complicated motion here through five days, and we're breaking it down each day. You need this workbook that we're talking about here. You need to print it out. You need to put it in your tennis bag as you're training this stuff, and you need these recordings so you can watch this information again and again and again. One last time, the link for that is right here. So go there. Please pick up the recordings. If you're getting any value from this, this is the insurance for 49 bucks that this stuff's actually going to stick and that you can look back on it and make sure that you get it perfect. So if you haven't yet, please go do that. If you're watching us on YouTube or Facebook, I haven't asked this yet because apparently I just forgot how social media works. Smash the like button. We would love to know that you guys are having a good time. We can actually see the likes fly through on our screen here. So it means a lot when we're seeing And share seeing it. That's what this is love. all about, right? Like yeah, pay share it the forward. content. Sh share it with someone that w it might help their serve, right? Most definitely. All right, guys. Thank you for the kind words in the comment section here. Tomorrow, day four of five. We will see you same time at 12 p.m. Eastern time. Have a great rest of your day. Take care.